I'm going to say this is this is your myocyte, and I'm going to say this is your this is not SA node or AV node. This is your regular myocyte, any cardiac cell, except the AV node or the SA node, which is calcium dependent. So uh, now, right, we said the status of the cell initially is negative 90 millivolts, right? So inherently, it's negative. I'm going to say it's negative 90 millivolts, and uh, the cell outside, right, has a lot of sodium. Inside the cell, we have potassium. Cells are bags of potassium and a sea of sodium. We just talked about that, right? And we have some uh, sodium leaky channels. But these are not voltage-gated channels. They are just leaky channels where some potassium can come in. So some, I mean, some sodium can come in. So some sodium can trickle in from the outside. If this is occurring, right, it's going to take the resting state from negative 90, right? It can, essentially, what it can do is it can elevate it to, let's say, negative 75 millivolts as more sodium came in. At negative 75 millivolts, right, then we have these voltage-gated sodium channels. So these are voltage-gated. And now the moment 75 is reached, a lot of the sodium that's now outside can rush in. When this is occurring, right, we're going to take our resting state of the cell, we're going to move this up. We're going to move this up so it's becoming progressively more positive. So negative 70, maybe negative 40, here maybe it's zero, right, here maybe it's plus 10. Right? At this point, uh, when it's at plus 10, what you're going to see is on the on here you have these voltage gated potassium channels which open up and what it's going to do is it's going to drive this potassium outside so you have the efflux of the potassium is going to leave the cell it's going to come out so a lot of the potassium that was in the cell is going to start come come out and there's a lot of these channels here right and as this is occurring right it's going to start to take the cell down As the cell starts to come down, specifically to the myocytes, there's also slow voltage-gated calcium channels. And calcium is usually found predominantly on the outside. We talked about the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? Uh, or endoplasmic reticulum. Or sarcoplasmic reticulum for the muscle, where the calcium is stored. So the calcium is going to start to come in via these channels inside. So you notice, as as you have uh, calcium coming inside and potassium leaving, you basically, what's, what it's going to do is going to have this plateau phase. So where there's no real change that's occurring. And this is done because you have at the same time potassium leaving the cells and calcium coming into the cells. And this is what's causing this pause to occur. But after a while, right, you have potassium losses that become higher. Right? And as the potassium losses become higher, as more potassium is leaving, this is starting to become more negative. And this calcium channels close. So when they close, you have now hypopolarization status of the potassium leaving the cell, and it's now approaching its equivalence point, right? And this is what it wants to do, right? So essentially, in a nutshell, right, this is what we see happening for the heart cells. And uh, because the heart cells are connected one to another via GEM junctions, right, these electrical windows, the GEM junctions we see with intercalated disks, these sodium channels can essentially jump in here and cause the same sequence of events to occur. Right, and this is what we see. Okay, so uh, here, right, we we see their intracellular concentration, and we see their extracellular concentration, and the equilibrium potential chart. So we know that as the sodium is coming in, it's going to take it towards its positive side, right? It's becoming more positive. Why? Because it wants to reach its plus seventy-two, right, equilibrium potential. So the moment it gets to this point, right, you have potassium channels that are open, and now potassium is coming from the outside and wants to reach its 
equilibrium potential, right? At negative 32, so it wants to go down. But before it goes down, right, you have this equivalence point where you have calcium that's coming in from the outside. And this is where you see this plateau. And now, right, as potassium reflux is greater, we have it going back to that uh, state again. And via these gap junctions, right, this can propagate cell to cell. Any questions about this? Right, and essentially when you have this uh, uh, occurring, right, this depolarization and repolarization, this is what we call action potential. Now, can you go up to the chart again? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, this, uh, while I have it here, you know what I'm going to do? Let me see if this will make sense for you guys. Let me take, uh, you know, I'll do this. So I'm going to draw on this point. Um, So this is this is basically an EKG signal, right? Uh, how how you obtain this with this um, ele uh, electrical uh, signal with anions, right, coming in and cations coming in, right? Uh, I should say cat cations because they're positive charge. So the P wave, right? We said was the atrial depolarization that you saw here, but this massive massive upstroke, right? Essentially, this is the ventricular depolarization. And how is this occurring? Is when you have these voltage-gated sodium channels that are open, sodium is coming in. You see this upstroke on this, right? As it's taking it to the positive side. And this is where you see that QRS forming, right? And as the potassium starts to leave, right? And it's going towards its negative status, right? Negative 88, right? It's taking it back to the negative status. This is where you see this T wave and the repolarization occurring. So now you could kind of correlate the uh, cation transmission with electrical signal and then a myocyte contraction, right? Uh, I hope that makes sense, uh, especially when you're learning the EKGs. This is essentially what's occurring. The sodium, which is responsible for depolarization, is what's causing this QRS complex to occur. And then the potassium that's leaving the cell is causing this T wave to occur. And then, right, someone asked me, right, what is the role of sodium potassium ATPases? And what they're going to do is they embedded in this cell membrane all over. What they're going to do is they're going to pump three sodium out and they're going to bring, right, two potassium back in to basically restore this negative gradient of negative minus 90 millivolts, right? So they'll pump out this uh, sodium that came in here and they're going to bring back this potassium that leaked out, right, from these channels. They're going to bring it back. And now they're back to the status and cell can propagate from one cell to another, right? So now that you, you saw this at least five, six times, right? At this point, this is like uh, becoming tiresome. You'll say, Nick, like, who cares, right? Like, you told me this five, six times already, right? All right. So here's why this becomes important, right? Why do you think I told you this five, six times? Because it's going to be on the test. <laughs> no, it's not going to be on the test. Well, it's going to be on the test, but uh, but it's not why I told you about this five, six times, right? With your new oh. protocol changes, I'm going to circle the drugs that are currently in your protocol. Oh, yeah, lidocaine. What else? Um, There's a beta blocker, metaprolol. Okay. And verapamil. Uh, deltaism, right? I don't, I, deltaism is there, right? So yeah. now I, so, so now you have drugs from every single class. So this is called one Williams classification of antiarrhythmic medication. So the way your antiarrhythmic medications exert their effects, right? They do, they block certain uh, channels, right? Or they block certain receptors. So for example, 
Lidocaine, right, is a class 2B sodium channel blocker. So let's go back. If it's a sodium channel blocker, right, which are voltage-gated sodium channels? These are channels, right? So I'm going to block these. So if I block these, is sodium coming in uh, just as easily as before? Nope. No. So nope. now if, imagine I had a fast heart rate. I had VTAC. I had heart rate of 180. I give you a sodium channel blocker. Am I going to slow down your heart rate? Yeah. Yeah. So this is how you got to start thinking of your medications, right? The sodium channel blocker will block sodium channels. Less sodium comes in, less depolarization is occurring, right? Makes sense. Now I'll talk about beta blockers. I think you already know, right? Beta 1. I block the beta 1. So give you metoprolol, right? Esmolol, propranolol. If I block beta 1, less of contraction. Why, why made this become important? Imagine somebody comes in with a heart attack and their heart rate is 126 beats per minute, right? Uh, this, first of all, increases myocardial oxygen demand. And but impo another important thing we talked about, what happens to your diastolic phase? Is it shorter or longer with this heartbeat? Your diastolic phase is shorter, right? If the diastolic phase is shorter, your coronary arteries are not filling as much. So maybe I want to slow down your heart rate, right? So let your heart to relax, get those coronary arteries to fill, right? Class three. Potassium channel blocker, amiodarin. To be honest with you, amiodarin is a multi-channel blocker. It does potassium, has calcium, has alpha beta blockers. It's a mixed channel blocker. But here they subdivide it into potassium. So if I block potassium, right, go back to the diagram. Right, I block potassium. So the cells cannot leave. So it, you, I cannot equilibrate back to this resting state. So I will again slow down the heart rate. But amiodarone does multi-blockade, multi right? And then calcium channel blockers is your deltiazem, right? So again, I block a calcium. Calcium cannot come in right here, right? Calcium, this, these were your calcium channels, right? Calcium cannot come in. So I cannot cause, right, the, the signal to propagate faster. So I slow down the heart. So what antiarrhythmics medications do, they either block certain receptors or they block uh, certain um, channels to not allow impulse propagation to continue, right? And that's how you wanna keep these in mind, right? So make sure, right, these drugs are in your protocols, make sure you're familiar with them, right? Here basically shows you what is the, 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 the site and the dependent ion for depolarization. Remember I said the SA node and the AV node, they're primarily calcium, channel dependent in order to depolarize. So, right? So, if you have a very fast, right, heartbeat, you have supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia. You see, you know, let me, let me make it smaller. Right? You see a lot of these QRS that are tight in, in complex and it's going, going, going. The heart is like 220, right? Uh, that's why you may want to consider calling for some deltaism, right? Uh, if, as long as the blood pressure is good, because if I block, right, my calcium channels, right? If I block my calcium channels, what's going to happen? I may slow this down. It's above the ventricle, supraventricular tachycardia is above the ventricles. Now, what about if I have ventricular tachycardia? I have VTAC. Do you think uh, deltaism, which is a calcium channel blocker? Let me just put delt. Is going to be as effective? No, uh, I would give uh, amio. So you could give amio, right? Uh, but you could also give lidocaine, right? Why you give lidocaine, right? You see it's a sodium, pr primarily it's sodium channel, right? Let me just go back to this. See, sodium channel? Lidocaine. So primarily, right, ventricular muscle. I slow down because VTAC stands for ventricular tachycardia. So I want to slow down the ventricles. So I want to give you maybe a sodium channel blocker. Give you lidocaine here, right? Yeah, they, they, you, could give, you could give amio because amio has a mixed action. I'll show you. I mean, it was very uh, toxic drug, but uh, it has, um, you know, some toxic action. Here, they basically show you 
adrenergic effects, right? What's going to happen? So that's your epinephrine response on these sites, right? Beta one response, yeah, you're going to increase contractility, strength of contraction, uh, and velocity. Uh, cholinergic effects, on the other hand, right, is your acetylcholine, ACH, and it's going to slow your heart rate down. Right, we know this, but uh, what I want to keep in mind, right, is this is this here. If you see the pr principal principal right cation for SI node AV node is your calcium. Right, that's where I want to be using. For your Purkinje fibers and your ventricular system, you notice it's what? It's sodium. That's why they say, right, for your ventricular tachydysrhythmias, you want to give sodium channel blockers. For your supraventricular tachydysrhythmias, uh, AFib, right, uh, aflutter, uh, atria tachycardia, right? You may want to consider calcium channel blockers, right? This is, this is where the, they're most effective. So this is how you want to look at your medications, right? So these are the medications. These are the antiarrhythmic medications. Uh, one Williams classification, right? Uh, any questions about that? When would you use uh, um, lidocaine instead of amio? So, to be honest with you, uh, I, would, I would use lidocaine if I have ventricular dysrhythmias. Even though currently you have amio in your protocols, I'm going to show you later in slides, MEO has a lot of side effects and it has a lot of toxic effects. So MEO can cause a lot of uh, more problems. So if, if I have a pure like ventricular tachycardia or uh, ventricular fibrillation on my monitor, I will probably utilize lidocaine as my medication of choice initially. If, if it's refractory, meaning it's not breaking, right? Uh, after giving all this, I may consider uh, going to, you know, some other modalities. Uh, but lidocaine will probably be my first choice of medication before I go to this drug. Uh, and right. you notice in your protocols, they give amio for, it's because it's a mixed blocker, they give amio for both supraventriculars and uh, ventricular rhythms. So supraventricular tachycardias and ventricular tachycardias because it has a mixed action. So it's not a pure drug per se. It has a mixed action. So whenever you have a drug like that, it, it's, it's like... A, it's not a master of one. It's like you know, it can it it can do multi action stuff, and that's and then you're not the best at anything. Oh, all right, thank you. Yeah, so this is basically the same I I drew right. This is just shows you the different receptors right uh, with sodium. Uh, it shows you with potassium, uh, and here right, uh, we were talking about the sodium potassium ATPs, right? You notice. It's taking the sodium out against the concentrating gradient, bringing the potassium inside with ATP use. Uh, this is the chart we talked about, right? This is the same uh, uh, equivalence potential uh, and correlates to it, right? So this is, this is what I was uh, showing, right? So this is the action potential. So for the majority of your... Uh, cells right for your cardiac cells this is done via sodium predominantly this the exchange here is when the potassium is leaving and then calcium is coming in and this is where you have basically excess of potassium that's leaving and blockage of calcium that's coming in it's going to go back to its resting status and then this is that this is the i n ion changes and the EKG that you're going to see here, right? The EKG is going to be superimposed like this. Uh, right? So here you have the correspondence to your ventricular depolarization and your T wave corresponds to ventricular repolarization. This is where the action potential is. This is where your actual uh, contraction of your heart occurs, right? So you have... You have uh, impulse propagation, right? So electrical followed by mechanical. So mechanical always follows after. It's never the first thing to be. The electrical signal is the first thing to happen, right? Uh, this also, right, We uh, important to know, you have the absolute refractory period, the absolute refractory period being, right, where no amount of impulse that comes in can trigger. So no amount of sodium that trickles in can cause the ne next impulse, but relative refractory period if you have strong enough stimulation to basically exceed the threshold you can basically trigger another one so you may you may get another like if it's strong enough here 
you may get another impulse right away. So let me do it like this, right? Another impulse come in. And that can cause uh, dysrhythmia to occur if this happens, right? So uh, on the EKG, the, the relative refractory right is always right by the T wave. So, so here, right, if you have anything hitting the T wave at this portion, and from here to here would be absolute refractory. This will be absolute refractory, and this will be relative refractory. So if you have another impulse that comes in, let's say like a ectopic beat on the heart, it can send you from having like your normal heartbeat, and then it comes here, it can send you to an erratic heartbeat, right? And this can happen if it happens on this portion. So you can go into VTAC or VFib if that occurs on that uh, relative refractory period. So, right? So these, these uh, ions that I showed you, right? Uh, propagation, right, with gap junctions, they're on these intercalated discs, right, which are embedded into the cardiac myocytes, right? And the reason why we learn all these drugs is this is a screenshot from your REMAC protocols, right? You guys see that? Yep. So this, the way these drugs work, right? This slows down your conduction through the AV node. AV node uh, conduction is slowing down. So the way you want to learn these drugs, uh, my tip for you guys will be the following. Uh, buy some uh, plain um, index cards, right? Flash cards. And then what you want to do is you want to write down the name of the medication. You want to write down the dose. And on the back, you want to write down the mechanism of action and where and how it works. So then when we are doing these scenarios, right, you're going to, right now you guys learning skills. So to explain, you guys learning like how to intubate, how to start an IV, how to do a piggyback, right? You're learning, it's called a task trainer skills. You learn the basic skills. Uh, then you're going to learn your EKG, how to apply the monitor, how to read the basic rhythm strip. But what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is going to bring it together, right? And then you're going to go to, as a team, right, team of two medics, two EMTs, you're going to get a patient, right? We're going to bring out that whole simulation monitor, um, drugs, uh, intubation kit, everything. And you're going to get a case. You got a 65-year-old male patient who complains of chest pain, right? And then you're going to have to implement your drugs. You're going to implement your skills. And you need to know how they function, right? The way you do your drugs is not uh, any, mini miny, mo. I'm going to go with this. Or the other popular answer is I'm going to call medical control and they will tell me what to use. So that's not a best answer. So the way you want to implement this is make flashcards, start going, associating them with your protocols. And then, uh, you know, you want to say, all right, I have a VTAC, which drug I want to give, why I want to give a sodium channel blocker, because it's going to work on the ventricular side more. What's the sodium channel blocker? Okay, it's lidocaine. Lidocaine, what's the dose? Lidocaine dose is 100 milligrams IV. Okay, I wrote it down on my thing. Does that make sense? Right? That's how you want to approach, right? So the, the next question I will, I, I, I told you this, I'll tell you that in the cardiac chapter, right? So in the setting of hyperkalemia here, this is in the protocols, right? There's in, in the suspected hyperkalemia, or calcium channel block overdose, administer calcium chloride. So let's say I have hyperkalemia, right? How is calcium going to help me? Who is going to answer that for me? Calcium fixes uh, calcium. Cal calcium what? Calcium fixes calcium. <laughs> calcium fix. But I have hyperkalemia. So let me let me hold on. Let me. I'll draw. I'll draw this thing. Right. Just we we'll go back to the. We said here was nine, nine, minus 90 millivolts, right? Here was negative uh, 75. This was threshold potential. This was resting potential, right? So we said in the cell, right, once you have uh, sodium that comes in, once it hits uh, minus 75, we have sodium channels that are going to open and a lot of sodium is going to come in. Sodium voltage gated is going to open. We're going to have, right? But in a setting of uh, hyperkalemia, right? In your blood and outside, there's a lot of potassium. 
And the way this works is slightly different than in your muscle cells. So in, we said hyperkalemia, hyper-K. But they say, you know, give me some calcium. Why? Right? You guys still uh, I'd like to take a crack at it. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. So hyperkalemia is too much potassium. Yes. So if you're gonna if you're gonna give calcium, yeah, you're gonna have an affinity on the calcium channels. Yeah. So I mean I, it, if I give yeah. you calcium, more calcium will come in. But how does that help me? So that helps. I want to say it'll slow down the repolarization. Uh, slow down, but but right now we don't have a. We, let's say let's say and we have hyperkalemia right now. We don't have any uh, like tachyarrhythmias. We don't have a, like a very high or low heart rate. Let's say let's say you uh, go to. Um, you know, interfacility transport you're doing, and they tell you this guy's potassium level is uh, 7.0. Mm -hmm. So it's very high, right? And the drug of choice, right? The first drug is calcium. That is correct. But my question is why? At this point, the guy that is hard rate, let's say, is 85, 84. Is it? Um, how, help me. Can you speak up louder? I couldn't hear what you said. I'm saying first because I know the answer already. You know, you know the answer? So tell me the answer. Let them think first about it. The what? Let them, try, let them try first. Let them try first to answer. I, I, I couldn't hear um, what you said. Let them, let them try to answer first. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Anyone else wants to uh, answer? I think I'm thinking that, like, um, I'm thinking that maybe the calcium is going to move the cell's voltage uh, to a point where it starts to um, it starts to where it's able to release uh, what's it called potassium from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Maybe the calcium um, helps it get to that point. Mm. Yeah, wouldn't calcium make the cell more negative, causing Cal calcium? Well, calcium calcium is positive. Calcium is positive, right? So it's going to yeah. take it to become so. It's going to move it. So let's say this is minus 75. Let's say this is uh, uh, zero. Let's say this is plus two. This is plus 10. So if I give calcium, it's positive. It's going to take it more towards positive value. It's going to go higher. Right? So calcium is a positive cation. Calcium is two plus. So at, at what it, when at a certain point, um, the, the cell would uh, polarize itself at a certain point where it would start to allow uh, potassium to be moved outside the cell. Against yeah. the gradient. But how does calcium help me? The, my, my question goes back. How does calcium help me? And I calcium is the proper drug to give in the setting of hy hyperkalemia. It's the first drug we give. I'm thinking the only way I can say is that it increases the cell's voltage. That's, that's, that's what I got. Increase cell voltage? Okay. It does increase cell voltage, but how does it help me? Maybe it activates uh, potassium gated channels. Uh, it doesn't activate the potassium gate. So I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happens. So unlike unlike in muscles, where we said a high amount of potassium causes muscle weakness, right? Because it causes an activation gate to shut. What actually happens here in the myocytes? If you have excess amount of potassium on the outside, right? A lot of potassium is coming in, secondary to hyperkalemia. Some of it will now come into the cell, and what happens is. Instead of having a negative nine, minus 90 millivolts, the resting state of the cell becomes minus 80 millivolts. Uh, and if it becomes minus 80 millivolts, right, you could see it only takes the difference 80 minus 75, only five millivolt difference to trigger action potential. So this can cause uh, tachydysrhythmias in the setting of hyperkalemia for the myocytes, heart cells, right? So we want to avoid these sticky dysrhythmias, right? So what we want to do is in the setting of hyperkalemia, my resting membrane potential is maybe minus 70 and threshold potential is minus 75. However, right, if I give you calcium, right, 
and calcium comes in inside your cell, what it's going to do is going to take your resting potential to maybe negative 65. So if I take your resting potential, right, uh, sorry, uh, uh, threshold potential, instead of minus 75 to minus 65, now I have a reestablished that 15 a millivolt difference. So, so now in the setting of hyperkalemia, where now is 80, but with calcium at 65, my difference is 15 millivolts. The same thing how it was initially without calcium, 90 and 75, right? It's 15. So in the normal cell, right, the resting voltage or resting status is negative 90 millivolts, and the threshold potential is minus 75 to give me a difference of 15. In the setting of hyperkalemia, it takes my resting status to minus 80, right, where the threshold is minus 75. So I only need five millimeters, right, to cause depolarization to occur, which can cause uh, tachydysrhythmia to occur. By giving you calcium, I now raise my uh, threshold potential to minus 65. Now I get this again, uh, minus 15 difference in your voltage. So I reestablish that 15 millivolt uh, gradient, right? This is basically, this is the study that they show, the hyperkalemia revisited. If you have hyperkalemia, right, you can cause this braid dysrhythmia basically to, to occur, right? Uh, and by giving you calcium, right, uh, they correct this hyperkalemia back to normal heart status, right? So how does this work? The way this works is basically, uh, as I was explaining, right, in a setting of hyperkalemia, right, you go maybe from minus 90 millivolts to minus 80 millivolts, which then basically your threshold is only, there's five millivolts difference, right? So I can trigger uh, the next impulse to come in. However, if I give you calcium, calcium is given the threshold potential shifts back from minus 75 to 65. So basically by giving you calcium, I go and I, and I do this, right? So now I still have 15, millivolt gradient. So we establish that gradient so that less uh, uh, chance of that depolarization, right? So they basically say uh, in, in, a, in a normal setting, minus 90 millivolts is the resting status, 75 is the threshold, you have 15 millivolts difference. In the setting of hyperkalemia, right, this can be moved to minus 80, the resting status, with only 5 millivolts difference. So I can basically trigger right, these dysrhythmias to occur. By giving you calcium, I then make this uh, resting, sorry, the threshold potential negative 65, and, to, and I reestablish that 15 millivolt difference. By reestablishing that 15 millivolt difference, right, I now move here. So now I need, again, this much to depolarize, as opposed to this much before, 75. See the difference? So less chance of this uh, hyperkalemic state to, to induce this type of tachydysrhythmia. So that's why we give calcium. But calcium is, is not, doesn't last that long in your body, only 60 minutes to you know, maybe two hours. So then after we give calcium, we gotta find ways to get this potassium out of your body. Some ways you could do it, right? We could give them insulin and uh, uh, we could give them uh, bicarb, and we can also do dialysis. So basically what those things will do, they will sequester that hyperkalemic state uh, into the cells and then we mobilize them out. So first line of drug is calcium, and then secondary drugs is like uh, insulin, sodium bicarb, and uh, even K-oxalate, right, and dialysis, which will mobilize the potassium out of the system. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, no? Yeah, I get it. Okay. I get it. All right. So this is just, uh, this shows you uh, same chart, slightly, it's slightly different, right? So it shows you all these uh, blockers, right? The lidocaine, we said, was the uh, sodium blocker. We said um, um, we had amiodarone, which was um, potassium, but it's actually a mixed blocker. We have your beta blockers here. And here you see, right, what they'll do. They'll reduce the conduction. So velocity will go down, 
right? They'll increase refractory period, so less chance of depolarization and, right, reduce the automaticity. But some of them, they have mixed action. So you could see, right, uh, amiodarone has slightly mixed action. Uh, but overall, right, they reduce the conduction through the, or the velocity of impulse propagation by blocking these channels. Uh, here, it kind of shows you, right? So amiodarone, the reason why I'd say it's mixed, primarily they show you uh, potassium, but you see it also has sodium blocking properties. As calcium blocking properties, it has beta adrenergic effect, it has alpha adrenergic effect. So it blocks beta receptors, it can block alpha receptors, it can block calcium receptors, uh, calcium voltage gated channels, sodium voltage gated channels, and potassium, right? Uh, where, uh, like lidocaine, it's purely sodium, right? So then, so then you'll say, okay, I'm iodine, right? So you see how it has a mixed action? So if it has a mixed action, right? Uh, right, you see how they give it for every single tachydysrhythmia. So they could give it for atrial fibrillation, which is uh, uh, supraventricular tachydysrhythmia, right? They could give it for ventricular tachycardia. They could give it for, uh, you know, torsades de poids, different types of ventricular rhythm. So because it's not pure, right, they give for all these rhythms. So what's the problem? So what's the problem with all this? The problem is this. Because it has such a mixed action, right? Look how much of uh, uh, things it can do, right? So it, it's a non-competitive alpha-beta blocker. So it blocks alpha-beta receptors. It can decrease the sinoatrial node, AV node, and decreases the heart rate, and it causes sinus bradycardia. So what, tell me of the possible side effects, you know, I could have with this drug. What do you think? Just looking at this. Well, to me, it looks like it can um, spark other arrhythmias. Um, that, it can, but yeah. but let's let's look. If I, if what what do you think is happening to my blood pressure if I if I give you alpha blocker? My blood tension. It's going to increase or decrease my blood pressure. Decrease. Decrease. What if I beta block or is going to do my to my heart rate? Heart rate. It's going to decrease it. Decrease, right? I decrease my SA node, AV node. Again, decrease the conduction, right? Decrease the heart rate. Uh, so, so because it does all these mixed things, right? You place a patient, you need to be very cognizant, right? I would do blood pressure every two minutes because you may have a patient, he is in tachydysrhythmia, you start this drug in two minutes, he's already in cardiac arrest because you have not uh, been doing serial blood pressures, right? Uh, so these are some of the complications that will arise, right? So, uh, so it can cause severe hypotension right? It can drop your blood pressure precipitously. It can give you bradydysrhythmias, so it can block your atrial ventricular node. So it can go, you can go patient from VTAC to a bradycardia. It can also cause thrombophlebitis. And by the way, in the hospital, we use an IV filter to give this medication because it has these crystals. And it also, if you shake it too roughly, it's going to uh, cause a lot of bubbles. Some of you came up to me and said, how come while well, I was doing the piggyback, how come it, it bubbles? The reason it bubbles is because if you mix it vigorously, in EMS field, I never seen anyone use IV filters. They only use this in the hospital for some unknown reason. Right? So it's going to cause thrombophlebitis, that's inflammation in your veins. It can cause bradydysrhythmias. It can cause severe blood pressure drops. Right? Uh, and it's thyrotoxic. It causes thyro thyroid toxicity. That's why those patients who get oral uh, amiodarone, who take it for, let's say, their AFib, right, must get uh, a thyroid test, testing done. Right, so they say get yeah, the thyroid function every three to six months. So this is for the patients who take oral uh, ME order, right? Uh, and it's uh, contraindicated in pregnancy. So you cannot give it if a patient has a, you know, tachydysrhythmia and they are pregnant. So then your drug of choice becomes lidocaine, right? But uh, I had patients where I start this drug and they go from blood pressure of like 100 over 80, and I start it one minute in, and their blood pressure is 80 over 40. What do you, what do you think you should do at this, this level? What would you do? Stop. Huh? Stop. Stop the drug, right? Stop the drug. Hopefully, you didn't mainline it. So if, they, if this is their arm, right, and they have IV access here, you didn't just hang your 
uh, MUO drone bag like this, right? Hopefully you did this where you have IV fluids first and then this one here. So then you could stop your MUO drone, open your IV fluids so that you can resuscitate your patient. So if I was giving this drug and um, first I make sure I have my IV fluids with IV access, this is drug is connected here. I want to make sure my patient is on my stretcher, semi fowlers, right? Uh, they are on the cardiac monitor. I hit, I put the blood pressure, you know, on your monitor, you could put uh, a non invasive blood pressure. And I'll put the least interval, like two minutes, one. If I have one minute, I put one minute. So every two minutes, if that's what your time interval has, so that it's giving you serial BP. Because you can go in one minute, your blood pressure is 80 or 40. If you haven't done that, you basically have a dead patient on your hand. And they must be on a, a cardiac monitor. So if they develop all of a sudden a brain dysrhythmia, it didn't uh, take you uh, the time to actually bring him to the ER where they do an EKG to determine that. So that drug is be very, very careful with MEO. Right? Any questions about that? Yeah, what page is this on the book? Uh, this may not be in your book, uh, but... Uh, uh, this is definitely in your protocol and something you should definitely know. This okay. is pharma, this is for this is more pharmacology. So I don't know if they have a separate book for pharmacology. So this is this is particularly the pharmacological side for amiodarone, or specifically the side effects of it. Right? Okay.